Greetings, and welcome to Theology Thursdays. We continue N.T. Wright's book, Surprise by Hope, with Chapter 2. Chapter 2 gets into the vitally important question of what do we mean when we talk about heaven? What do we mean when we talk about destinations of people after they die? The answer to this is perhaps surprising once we get into the weeds in this a little bit. Chapter 2 for N.T. Wright is once again in the same line of still describing. Where exactly is the confusion? And what do we really think heaven is? To illustrate this point, N.T. Wright opens up with what he refers to as a commonly requested and quoted line from a particular Anglican preacher. Here is, this, here is the uh, quote that he gives, but beware that he's going to tell you it doesn't mean what you think it means. Let's take a listen to what N.T. Wright is talking about. Death is nothing at all. It does not count. I have only slipped away into the next room. Nothing has happened. Everything remains exactly as it was. I am I, and you are you, and the old life we lived so fondly together is untouched, unchanged. Whatever we were to each other, that we still are. Call me by my old familiar name. Speak of me in the easy way which you always used. Put no difference into your tone. Wear no forced air of solemnity or sorrow. Life means all that it ever has meant. It is the same as it ever was. There is absolute and unbroken continuity. What is this death but a negligible accident? Why should I be out of mind because I am out of sight? I am waiting for you, for an interval, somewhere very near, just around the corner. All is well. Nothing is hurt. Nothing is lost. One brief moment, and all will be as it was before. How we shall laugh at the trouble of parting when we meet again. This is a quote from a preacher named Scott Holland, who, by the way, was preaching at a funeral. And N.T. Wright points out, so many people request this particular preface to the sermon to be read at funerals, memorials, but this view is exactly one that Holland himself argues against later in the sermon. Why would this particular preface be problematic? The issue that comes up when talking about death is that it is so often the case that we shy away from talking about this discontinuity that we experience between we who are still alive, and those who have passed on. And this discontinuity is sometimes smoothed over, or in the case of the view that Holland is denying in the paragraph that was read, that we attempt to treat death as if it is nothing, as if nothing happened, and as if, if anybody treats it as if something happened, they have a deficient view of death. Not only does Holland not think this, but Wright also says this is not the Christian stance. The reason why this is not the normative Christian stance towards death is that death for the Christian is something to be taken gravely seriously. It is not helpful nor realistic to deny that something terrible, something tragic, something unhuman has happened in death. Something that is wrong has happened. This breaking of relationship by physical means of passing away. And to, on the one hand, deny that anything has happened, but also, on the other hand, to overly focus on the break and continuity and the finality of death, neither one of these poles, as Wright suggests, is actually the Christian stance about death. Death is not something to be ignored, but death also is not the final victor. And so 
in the talking about death and in the somewhat nervousness we have of speaking about death in stark terms, perhaps, we run across a tension within Christian eschatology, the belief about end things, and in Christian soteriology, salvation, is what exactly does death mean for the Christian then? If it's not something to simply be ignored, nor if it's something to be intensely dwelt on, what are we to make of it? Wright offers another Anglican priest's stance on this, who is also one of the most well-known Western poets of the last 500 years, John Donne. And Wright emphasizes that although the poem is going to sound very similar to Holland's view that he is denying, there's a couple of lines that are the key to understanding where we're going when it comes to Christian views of death. Take a listen to John Donne's poem. Death be not proud, though some have called thee, mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those who thou thinkst thou dost overthrow die not, poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me. From rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be, much pleasure, then from thee much more must flow, and soonest our best men with thee do go, rest of their bones and souls' delivery. Thou art slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men, and dust with poison, war, and sickness dwell, and poppy or charms can make us sleep as well, and better than thy stroke. Why swellest thou then? One short sleep past we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. Dunn is dealing with this in of course, the wonderful way that John Donn does his poetry. But the key, the key to it, are the last two lines. One short sleep past we wake eternally, and death shall be no more, death thou shalt die. The hinge lies in the reality of what death is now, that we live on this side of the one who has defeated death. Death is seen in this particular image as an enemy that is a defeated enemy. And the manner in which death is a defeated enemy is put very clearly by the New Testament, which is that death no longer has dominion over someone specific. And that specific person is Jesus Christ in the bodily resurrection of the dead that is described within the Gospels and within Paul's letters and within the rest of the New Testament. However, we have to get clear as to what Jesus' resurrection means and what Jesus' resurrection means for the reality of death. And this, again, is the heart of where we have to begin when it comes to Christian belief in life after death. We have to confront what Jesus' bodily resurrection means for the reality of death. In Christian views about death, Wright points out that we are in a spectrum between two beliefs, or at least between two generally stated beliefs. On the one hand, death is a defeated enemy. It is an opponent that has been overthrown. And this opponent, this final opponent, although with the mortal power of our physical bodies, no longer has ultimate power over our ultimate destinies. The iconography of death as enemy can be seen fairly significantly throughout Christian art and history, especially throughout the early church. Death is the thing that is personified as the opponent of Christ Jesus that Christ has ultimately defeated. And imagery of this can be seen within Paul's letters and the Gospels themselves. 
Christ is risen from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, so by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. As in one man all die, so also in one, one man shall all be made alive. So also in Christ shall we be raised. Hence why the traditional Christian burial practice is for not only the church to face towards the east, towards the rising of the sun, which is itself a metaphor of the resurrection, but for Christians to be buried facing east, because it is a sign and symbol of the hope of not just we will be raised one day, but that this person in a body like this shall be raised one day. And so, it is a visceral hope in the resurrection, a tactile hope in the resurrection, a bodily hope in the resurrection, not some disembodied um, wiggly jiggly experience. It's a real physical flesh and bone spiritual resurrection. But there's also the other view that is in some of our hymns also seen, which is that Death is that which is a welcome friend, bringing us to our destination. Death is a portal that we walk through in order to go to where we are destined to go, the heavenly realms. You can see this in a couple of different hymns. All Creatures of Our God and King, which is based off, which is uh, attributed to St. Francis, and Thou Most Dear and Kindly Death Waiting to Hush Our latest breath or our final breath, it's death is seen as this friend that is a transport to where we are going. After all, we have to go through death in order to receive life. This is something very clearly seen in Christian theology around baptism and also in theology around how we pass into death. But this is a fine sentiment. But we have to be careful as to where we go with this, because when we see death as the portal or transport to the heavenly realms, we slide somewhat precariously towards a view of death that actually might not be Christian. Wright points out that when we talk about death as a transport going somewhere, we have to think about where we think we're being transported. Now we have to think about what do we mean by heaven? What do we mean by hell? What do we mean about the afterlife? The view that death is a transport taking us somewhere else than where we are at the current moment might have its roots maybe not necessarily in Christian beliefs about bodily resurrection. An extreme view of this is put forward in something that N.T. writes, uh, some, something that was sent to N.T. Wright by a colleague who was horrified by this particular sentiment that I'm about to read. But pay careful attention to this notion of us going somewhere else and of the personification of death as not a defeated enemy, but as a redescription of what has happened. This is a quote from a book called What's Heaven? And pay careful attention to what the author says and be discerning as to what we're talking about when we mention heaven. Maria Shriver says, Heaven is somewhere you believe in. It's a beautiful place where you can sit on soft clouds and talk to other people who are there. At night, you can sit next to the stars, which are the brightest anywhere in the universe. If you're good at throughout your life, then you get to go to heaven. When your life is finished here on earth, God sends angels down to take you up into heaven to be with him. And Grandma is alive in me. Most important, she taught me to believe in myself. She's in a safe place, with the stars, with God and the angels. She is watching over us from up there. I want you to know, says the heroine to your great-grandma, that even though you are no longer here, your spirit will always be alive in me. Now, this book aimed at children, right, I think correctly, says, is the default view of many in the West. Notice what it says about what heaven is. Heaven is a place in the clouds. 
Now, this might not be a uh, very interesting or groundbreaking description, but the thing that needs to be said, heaven is a place that is not here. Heaven is a place that is away from here, that people who die go and are transported to. It is a place that we are taken away from the mortal world into the immortal world, into the spiritual world. But also, notice an interesting tension within the writing itself. The reality of life after death is said to be that if you're good enough, you go to heaven. Ooh, this one is a re this one is a real interesting one because now there is a merit to whether we get to go to heaven or not. Now we don't talk about the other place, the H E double hockey stick place, right? But the the implied sort of reality that if one passes a certain test or bar, one goes to heaven. Ooh boy, let's pay really careful attention to that sentiment, because that is a horrifying sentiment when we start getting down to the, to the very base of this. When one starts weighing merit, we're not doing it in Christian fashion anymore. Instead, we are applying some sort of litmus test as to good works, which the Bible explicitly says it is not by what we do that we are given eternal life, but rather who we are in Christ. It's not our righteousness that gets us into heaven. It is Christ's righteousness healing us of our sinfulness. That's so explicitly said that Paul says this directly. Two things need to be said explicitly about this sentiment. Number one, be careful, be careful about this bifurcation of going somewhere else. Because notice Jesus' resurrection didn't take place somewhere else, but actually right where his body was. This will be brought up again in a later chapter, but I want to flag this for you to pay attention to. Be careful about the bifurcation of place, which we'll talk about here more specifically in the later chapters. But be oh so wary about this concept of merit. One earns one's way to heaven if you're good enough, as this particular quote says. Be very careful about that and ask yourself, is that what Jesus actually taught? Because Wright points out, as he continues, that it comes as something of a shock whenever it is mentioned, and this is absolutely the case biblically, that there is oh so very little in the Gospels about going to heaven when you die. This concept of leaving this place to go somewhere else when you start really looking for it, might be mysteriously or shockingly absent from the New Testament. That this sentiment of being taken away to somewhere else might not actually be solidly biblical. Two very vivid examples are given of this. The first is the Gospel of St. Matthew. So, Something particular to the Gospel of St. Matthew is that in uh, difference to the other Gospels, the other synoptic Gospels of St. Mark and St. Luke, is that when Jesus refers to the kingdom, it is referred to in the Gospel of St. Matthew as the kingdom of heaven. Whereas in the other Gospels, it's referred to quite normatively as the kingdom of God. Now, in St. Matthew's Gospel, the kingdom of heaven is used in a very specific manner and is used to emphasize a specific theme in the Gospel of St. Matthew, which is not that we are thinking about the kingdom that is away somewhere else, but over and over and over again, Jesus uses parable, uses simile, and in the most explicit fashion, 
uses his very prayer that he teaches the disciples to speak about the kingdom of heaven not as somewhere else, but being inaugurated in time right now on earth. When Jesus refers to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is like. Jesus refers to specifically present tense language. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that is sown in with the rest, and all of a sudden it grows up into this large thing. It's the smallest of the seeds, but yields this giant plant, and it springs up from seemingly nowhere. But that's not something that is away somewhere else. That's something that is growing up in the midst of what's happening right now and exploding onto the scene. You see, that parable has nothing to do with a bifurcation between heaven and earth, it has everything to do with the kingdom of heaven springs up on earth. John the Baptist and Jesus proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven is not over there, but is at hand, is here, is right now. That's a completely different sentiment from what you get when you bifurcate, oh, heaven's the nice place that maybe we get to go for good enough. Not so within the Gospels, and actually not so within the book of the Revelation to John either. One of the proof texts that sometimes gets given as to heaven is somewhere else and earth is, is down here is the Revelation to St. John. The Revelation to St. John being that heaven where John is caught up into is this future reality of here is what's going to happen. Of course, Revelation has those things in there. However, the throne room scene in which, in which John writes about, when the four living creatures of Isaiah and also seen in, in, in the Revelation, and the 24 elders throw their crowns before the king, bow before the throne, and say, holy, 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 Lord God of power and might. That happens in chapter 4 of St. John's Revelation. This is not in the future visions that John is given of the things that are to happen. Rather, you are given the distinct sense that the vision that St. John is being given at that moment is present reality for John. That this is the inauguration of what is already happening. And especially as it comes to the teaching over St. John's revelation, in church history, you get the sense of immediacy rather than somewhere, sometime. That this is a current reality. Christ is reigning right now in the midst of this wonderful spiritual vision that St. John gets, and that it needs to be emphasized when the new Jerusalem is given we on earth don't go up to the New Jerusalem in the, uh, in the Revelation of St. John, but the New Jerusalem comes down out of heaven to earth. And it is said, the home of God is among mortals. It's the opposite direction in the, gos uh, in the Gospels and in the Bible. Heaven comes to earth in our very midst, not us going somewhere disembodied somewhere else. So heaven as a term, so often in common parlance is understood as a destination somewhere else, but rather biblically, the concept of heaven is rather something that is springing up by the actions of God in the midst of current reality. That the kingdom of heaven being at hand was not Jesus simply being hyperbolic. That Jesus, in his accomplishment of the destruction of the final enemy of death, actually inaugurates a completely new reality. And as you might be able to kind of sense, a reality that we are actively, right at this minute, participating in. Not that we maybe at some point, sometime in future reality, if we go somewhere else, participate in. But rather, it's in our very midst. So the question, obviously, for some of us, especially if this is a new uh, sort of way of thinking about this, is 
where exactly do we get this concept then of heaven as being somewhere else? Well, Wright puts forward, we're dealing with a couple of very entangled issues when it comes to what we think about life after death and what we think about heaven and what we think about what the reality of death really is. One of the issues that Wright points out is that, as he points out in the first chapter that we read last week, the classical understanding of what we mean by heaven and hell has been under question. We have been asking, especially in the aftermath of the horrific world wars that we went through, the hell as being something worse than that, something worse awaits someone after death, was something that, for various reasons, we really re-examined. But an interesting consequence of that is that the examination of hell has also mysteriously led to the uh, diminution of the promise of heaven. And it once again gets into this, uh, this idea of hell as being a destination as well as heaven being a destination. Is that actually what these things are? And the confusion that Wright points out of many Christians is that we only think of these things as being destinations that we go away from current reality into rather than realities that are springing up within our midst. The other, the other part of this question of destination is that when we talk about the bodily resurrection, we have to talk about the kind of a barefaced reality of there's only really been one bodily resurrection that's happened in time, and that's the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, we'll get into the, to the issue around some of the raisings, such as that of Lazarus, such as that of the saints in the end of the Gospel of St. Matthew who were raised from the dead. We'll talk about those as being a distinct case um, when we come to the later chapters, but what is Definitely the case is that Christians believe that Jesus was bodily raised from the dead in a new, recognizable in some way body that is flesh and blood, but also is completely augmented in some way that is difficult to describe. The Gospels make it very clear. It's a body. Jesus eats with the disciples. Jesus shows the scars in his hands and his feet and his side but it's also a body that is um, wildly different than our expectations of, of what perhaps we're trying to describe. As a New Testament professor once described, we're not exactly sure what kind of body it is, but all we can say is it was some body. I think that that's a good way of describing it. But the confusion now becomes, well, what happens to someone between when one reposes in death and when one is raised bodily at the resurrection of the dead when Jesus Christ comes again in the parousia. We'll talk about that concept in a couple of chapters as well. What is the intermediate state of someone between their death and their bodily resurrection? And to put it squarely in the Protestant camp, this is something that Protestants have, have struggles with. If you're in the Roman Catholic camp, where you have a pretty solid theology of purgatory, which purgatory is an intermediate state, the um, confusion over purgatory is generally less as it comes to traditional expressions of Roman Catholic theology than it comes to Protestant theology. John Calvin himself said there is an intermediate state of living between the death of someone and the resurrection of the body. But the uh, thing that John basically said is that it's not purgatory in the Roman Catholic sense. We can disagree about that, but what is very clear is that, well, maybe Protestants know what they don't believe about this. Maybe Roman Catholics know what they do believe about this. But for Protestants and for Catholics, what's the intermediate state? And what exactly does that mean for someone who has reposed in the Lord but has not been bodily raised in the resurrection of Jesus Christ yet? It is most definitely not the case of this 
uh, boring reality of sitting on clouds with harps and with angel wings and being bored out of one's mind until God decides to get his act together. That is such a secular blending of what Christians believe, quote unquote, that it's hard to wrest that away from what the wider society might think that Christians think. But functionally, what does the confusion about these things actually do? Well, the effects of the confusion as to what exactly Christians believe can show up in our hymnody. Wright gives some very vivid examples. I want to give an example of my very own that comes from a well-beloved hymn that probably many of you know, which is the hymn, I'll Fly Away. Think about what that hymn says within its words, especially within the refrain. I'll fly away, O oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. The verses of that, of that hymn also emphasize this idea of heaven is away, right? We're using that in direct quotes, that heaven is somewhere else than where we are at the moment. Now, is that necessarily a bad thing to sing that I have hope that I will go and be with my Lord and Savior? No, it's not bad. But we have to be careful about the locative sense as to what we mean by that. Are we, when we die, going somewhere else? Or are we reposing in the sleep of death to be raised in a bodily resurrection at the end of time? You might preempt where Wright is going with this, but Wright wants to give a couple more examples as to where this shows up in our hymnody. Now, there are some more blunt texts, such as when Wright points out the Abide With Me hymn has the line, Heaven's morning breaks and Earth's vain shadows flee. Now, there are entire hymns, as he says, that talk about this idea of Earth passing away and Heaven being on the dawn of the morning or to even use the language of home as being a locative sort of thing. Wonderful, wonderful Chris, Christian hymn of How Great Thou Art has this line in it. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Not to beat a dead horse, but that line is a quote of St. Paul, that the dead in Christ shall be caught up together with him in the clouds, and we will be with him forever. That particular line has a hermeneutical context that we do well to pay more attention to. When Paul is talking about this, he's talking about a language of someone who is the ruler of the world, someone who is in an imperial procession, coming to their destination, not calling us to go to them, because in an imperial procession, and St. Paul knows this, in an imperial procession, it is customary for the people of the town of which the emperor is passing through to go out to meet the procession, to go out to them and to usher them back to the town of which they come from. Think about the line again. The dead in Christ shall be raised first, and they will be they will meet him in the meet him in the clouds. This is language of imperial procession. Christ, the emperor of the universe, basically in this sort of metaphor that Paul is using, is someone who is being greeted as he comes to his destination. I'm, again, this is a hobby horse of my own, uh, but Wright makes very clear. Merely seeing heaven as a locative sort of thing that is away from here somewhere else is borderline not biblical. Um, we'll talk about the exceptions that proves the rule in a later chapter, but this idea of going away somewhere is maybe a bit more platonic 
in other words, having to do with Plato, um, the philosopher, rather than Christian. Now, there is a Christian hymn that plays with this in a helpful fashion, one of the great hymns of All Saints' Day. The golden evening brightens in the west. Soon, soon to, to faithful warriors comes their rest. Sweet is the calm of paradise the bless. Alleluia, alleluia. And then, after this, happens the resurrection. But lo, there breaks a yet more glorious day. The saints triumphant rise in bright array. The king of glory passes on his way. Alleluia, alleluia. Which leads to getting to the, getting to the New Jerusalem. There is a particular locative sense in which the saints locatively are raised in a bodily sense on earth to then go to the new Jerusalem that is, in the language of Revelation, coming to earth, where heaven and earth are enjoined forever. Notice the profoundly different way that this changes how we view what happens in life after death. In this, as Wright wants to argue strongly, more biblical view of what it means to believe in the resurrection. And in this very sense, that uh, Wright says a couple of symptoms of the fact that we have lost sight of the radical belief in the bodily resurrection has for us as Christians is that several things have happened. First of all, that Christmas has now outdone Easter as the biggest Chris Christian celebration of the year. It's a big Christian celebration, don't get me wrong. The Feast of the Incarnation of Christ is a big deal celebration. But we celebrate that incarnation because of the revelation of who Christ is in his passion and death and resurrection and ascension. And those are the keys for us in understanding who Jesus is. So the fact that Christmas is a far more observed secular thing than the Easter season is, even though Easter Bunny aside and all the chocolates being exchanged at that point, the fact that we have such a displaced emphasis on other things in the, in the church calendar other than Easter, Wright says, is a symptom that we've lost what the power of Easter's message is. But the other thing that Wright once again points out, as he did in the first chapter, the fact that we don't know what funerals are for. The fact that when we go to funerals, it's often this confused muddle of people who are in grief and bereavement and a minister who's trying to figure out something nice to say about the person who died um, and trying to figure out what exactly we're doing in that situation. What exactly are we accomplishing in this? What's the purpose of a funeral? This confusion about what a purpose of a funeral is is a symptom, Wright says, of not understanding what we believe about the resurrection. However, a main thing that needs to be said about what the view of heaven up there, earth down here does is a far deeper and potentially more insidious thing then we might give credence to it first. Wright points out that uh, Karl Marx famously said that the that religion is the opium of the people. Opium, obviously, as being something that is a uh, distraction, a, a drug-induced distraction of the world around them. And in the same way, Marx is using this particular metaphor very powerfully that religion is that thing that uh, sedates people and uh, that um, in some cases removes people from the present reality of the world. Now, when we start talking about the ways that we describe the realities of the world as the earth is passing away and heaven is where we're trying to get to. Or earth is just a vain shadow and heaven is really where we're trying to get to in the destination. Or maybe even more specifically, 
Earth is just a shabby old physical thing, and the physical stuff of the world is just going to be gone away, and we're trying to get to that one place where there is the immortality of spiritual living. That is Platonic philosophy rather than Christian theology. Platonic philosophy, um, Plato said this, uh, is that the point of the realities of heaven, this eternal reality, the unchangeable reality, is that we are not to focus on the shabby shadows of the perfect forms of heaven. We only have shadows of reality down here. Our bodies are shadows of what we're meant to be. That runs headlong smack into the Jewish understanding of what future reality is. Because once again, we are starting to sharpen our focus as it comes to resurrection. Is the secular understanding of physical reality passing away, spiritual is what we're after, really Christian or is it Platonic philosophy? Wright says it very clearly is not Christian because Christians are in the heritage line of traditional Jewish beliefs in life after death. Well, what are traditional Jewish beliefs in life after death? We'll get to that actually in next chapter, but he gives you a little taste, which is that the Jewish belief in the bodily resurrection is something that is unique to Judaism and something that we have to take seriously with the fact that Jesus is a Jewish rabbi. Jesus is within a particular tradition of theology and a particular revelation of theology. Jews believe in the resurrection. We see this in the Pharisees in the New Testament. The Sadducees deny the resurrection at the end of the age. The Pharisees affirm there is a general resurrection at the end of the age. Jesus agrees with the Pharisees. There will be a resurrection at the end of the age. But the bodily resurrection was something that was so looked down upon by philosophers and and historians of the time that were secular. As we'll hear uh, for in, a, in a couple of chapters, you don't have to tell me in modern day that, well, modern uh, understandings of the world has disproved that anybody could be raised. And N.T. Wright says, listen, Plato and Aristotle knew people don't come back from the dead. Cicero knew that people don't come back from the dead bodily. Ovid, the poet, knows that people don't come back from the dead bodily. The ancient world knew that people don't come back from the dead bodily. So why do the Jews say that there's a bodily resurrection? And likewise, why do Christians say there is not only it will be a bodily resurrection, but there has been a bodily resurrection, specifically of Christ Jesus? So now we're focusing. Now we're getting into... There are some specific beliefs about the resurrection that we have to focus on more specifically than the general heaven up here, earth down here sort of view. Which leads in finality to the questions that Wright will deal with. The first two questions, as Wright says, are going to be presumed rather than having an entire chapter devoted to them. Question number one, how do we know what life will be in Christian theology in life after death? How do we know what we know? This is something that is referred to as an epistemological question. Epistemology is the study of how we know what we know. The question that Wright will be presupposing is, okay, we are asking, fundamentally, how do we know that something is a Christian belief in life after death and whether it is not one? How, what is the thing that we know that we can put our flag on that can say, this is what we believe in life after death and those other views are not? How do we know what we know? The second question has been underneath the surface the whole time we've been talking, which is, do we have immortal souls? And if we do, 
what exactly are they? What is an immortal soul? If we have souls that are parts of our bodies, if we have spiritual realities about ourselves that are immortal, what are we to say about them and how do we know that they exist? And then the third is the big hinge. What does Jesus's resurrection mean for us? What does the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, as is attested to in the Gospels and in St. Paul and in church tradition, what does that mean for us? Now, it's not merely meaning what does that mean for our life after death. No, Wright is going to make the claim that if the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if we believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ really did happen, it must, by necessity, change fundamentally the way we live right now. We live in a completely different manner if that is true. And that means that if we live in a completely different manner, that means the resurrection of Jesus Christ has everything to do with how we should live now. Rather than it being a simple hope in this far-off land of heaven, whatever we mean by that, it instead turns into heaven is breaking into the world at this moment. And what does that mean for us in Christian theology and ethics? How we believe in life after death and how we live right now in the reality of life after death. And as Wright says, the whole crux of the book is to reconcile the line in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and what that means synergistically for what we as Christians believe about the afterlife, about death, and about the resurrection of the body.